much everyone for joining us this evening. My name is James Sutton. I'm the chairperson in the English department here at FIU. It gives me great pleasure to, uh, to be here with all of you this evening. Uh, I'm looking forward to Dean Ray's talk. Uh, it's wonderful to have you back from, from Montana. Thank you so much for joining us. You'll hear more about uh, Dean Ray in a couple of minutes. As is our uh, tradition here at our, our lectures for Exile Studies, we take a few minutes to keep you going. If you've been here, you know what I'm referring to. Um, so I would like to introduce a colleague of mine, Dr. Milbauer, who is the director of our graduate program in English. We have several of our MA students in our, our program here who are under his tutelage. Glad you could make it. Um, Dr. Bilbao has also been directing our program in exile studies for the last several years. He founded this program, uh, created it, and has been working very hard, as many of you in the room know, over the course of the last several years to foster this program, both in terms of its intellectual enterprise as far as our certificate program goes. Uh, we've now graduated 20, 20 some students another 20 uh, who are currently in the program. Uh, it's um, an interdisciplinary program housed within English, but with deep roots in many other departments, including political science and international relations. So we're very happy this evening to be partnering in particular with, with PIR and, and Dr. Salakar and her department uh, as we bring uh, Dean Ray back to talk to us this evening about exile politics. Uh, the Exile Studies program has brought a number of renowned speakers to FIU over the course of the last several years. Dr. Milbauer will mention a few of those to you in a moment. Uh, and also wishes to tell you about a very exciting project that we have coming up uh, in the fall. Um, he'll also explain to you that uh, most of the events and programming of Exile Studies has been done very closely in tandem with our Center for the Humanities and the Urban Environment uh, uh, with Dr. Michael Gillespie's aid and uh, collaboration. So I think Michael will, I think, also be speaking to you in just a minute. With no further ado, then, I want to ask Dr. Lepard to come up and tell you more about the program. Uh, lecture series 
and other kinds of works that are associated with this program. The last, I will not mention to you what we've done in the last three years, just in the last year, because what we were doing in the last year was also leading to this lecture with Dr. Um, Dean Ray, and is looking forward to another enterprise about which I will elaborate in a couple of minutes. During the last year, we had a program which we titled um, Exile, Patronage, and the Arts. And within the context of that program, we brought major figures to talk to us about, in one case, the president of Bard College was talking about the place or the role of American universities regarding exile intellectuals. And Bard College is known for providing refuge for those who come from places of crisis. Uh, we also had another uh, noted scholar and writer, and that's the Haitian American writer, Edwidge Denticourt, who also talked about the American universities playing a major role in uh, the lives of immigrants and the lives of intellectuals. And then we uh, inaugurated, in regard to another lecture, a new program that we currently have with the Betsy Hotel on South Beach. We inaugurated our first annual Betsy FIU Exile Studies, um, Exile Studies annual lecture, and they provided a month-long stay for a noted Zimbabwean writer and uh, human and humanitarian and activist for human rights, and that is Chen Huawei, who was here, uh, gave a wonderful lecture, participated in a seminar, uh, participated in a panel that Dr. Gillespie has organized, and done a lot of good things. So we hope that this cooperation with the Betsy Hotel will continue into the future and will flourish. And again, Mr. Away, the Zimbabwean writer, talked about the significance and the importance of institutions of higher education in providing safe haven for those who find themselves um, under dire circumstances in their own countries. And this was leading up to yet another talk today, and that is Dr. Reyes, when he is going to talk about um, exiles and their role in significant role in American politics and diplomacy. And God knows that in this country, which in fact is like the Kibbutz Galoyot and the other of exiles, political uh, figures and diplomats and politicians find very important roles to play here. Dr. A will elaborate on it. And these all lectures are even got to a major event that you will have in the fall of 2014, that is this coming fall, a project that Dr. Sutton and Dr. Gillespie and I worked for a number of years to bring to fruition. And that is a cooperative project with the Coral Gables Museum uh, to mount a exhibit that was curated a few years ago by the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York and has been since traveling to different institutions. And that exhibit is dedicated to a very important uh, moment in American history, a moment which I define as time of intellectual reciprocity. Very few people know that during the uh, late 30s, uh, they know this, that many intellectuals in Germany and other countries tried to escape Germany and to save themselves, but unfortunately there were no places that wanted them so badly that they would arrange for immigration exceptions or labor department approvals. But there was a group of colleges uh, that opened their doors and were hospitable to these major scholars and major professors and artists. And these are colleges associated with the black colleges in the South. And most people don't really know about them. And that was an incredible moment in American history, I think, in American education, where the black colleges in the South had the foresight to know that not only will they benefit from the fact that these scholars will be housed in their own colleges, but they will also uh, provide refuge and save lives. And this exhibit that the Coral Gables is putting up, and which we negotiated with them to put up, 
is, I think, going to be a major contribution to uh, intellectual life of our university and the Coral Gables Museum, as well as the community at large. And with Dr. Sutton, Dr. Gillespie, and others, we are organizing a number of programs that will uh, be adjunct to that exhibit. And I hope that all of you will have a chance to come see, participate. So you see, it's all one of the piece in that way, and we are working towards a particular goal that we have in the future. Uh, I don't want to talk too much now, although what I have to say is of major importance, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is more important is to tell you one simple thing, that these kinds of events and this program have never been possible without the generous help of a number of entities. I want to acknowledge the College of Arts and Sciences that has been behind this project for the last five years, only the last three years, to legitimize it in that way. And I also have to confess that Dr. Nefore had a major role to play in supporting this uh, project, and I'm really thankful to you, Dr. Ray, for having the foresight to see how important an endeavor this is. Uh, <clears throat> also, I want to thank my colleagues in the English department for their support. My students who are here, many of them from past classes, and who time and again return to celebrate with us the spirit of indomitability that Texas very often display in their host countries. I, again, want to underscore what Dr. Sato was saying, that without the close cooperation between Dr. Sato, the chair of the English department, and Dr. Michael Gillespie, the recently founded, or three, four years ago founded Center for the Humanities, these kinds of projects we would not be able to mount. And then, of course, and both Dr. Sutton and Dr. Gillespie are not only my dear colleagues, but also my friends, and they are my inspiration as well. And I'm deeply, deeply thankful to them for all the help that they provided. Uh, I also want to say that the University at Large is very supportive of this, of this endeavor. We have a number of sponsors to whom we go for sponsorship and for support. And some of them are here today to uh, be part of this project. Uh, Dr. John Steck, the head of SIPA, uh, we go back for many years. And when Dr. Steck was the head of the Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship Studies, and whenever I came to Schnorr to back to him for funds to help out, Dr. Steck never asked what for, who is going to be the person there. He was generous, and he remains as generous as he was in the past, and I'm grateful to you. The Cuban Research Institute, that, uh, at the helm of which is Dr. Jorge Duane, is very generous, and we really appreciate uh, your help, and we partnered with you in the past with the Cuban Research Institute, and we are doing that now, and we hope to have that partnership launched in the future as well. The Latin American Caribbean Studies has been also very, very important to us and again helped us whenever it could be help if we needed help. So as you see, and I cannot forget the Graduate English Association, the Sigma Tau Delta, our own students, and my colleagues, and especially Dr. Ken Johnson, who is our historical collector in Liberty. He provides us with wonderful pictures and we appreciate them very much, not only the pictures of the presence here in the inspiration. Dr. Kevin Johnson, we appreciate that. So from the enumeration of these names, you can see that uh, the Exosalis program, what we are doing is validated by your presence, by your support. And again, I'm deeply thankful for that. Uh, just a couple of words in addition about Dr. Nicolay. Uh, we started to talk to him about coming out here some time ago. And before he left, he said, you have to come back because we are very interested in what you are doing and about the connection between America and politics. So I know that he had to traverse a lot of miles and had a long journey, but he is here. And that is absolutely great. Before just finishing and asking Dr. Gillespie to say a few words. Our next lecture together with Dr. Gillespie is Dr. 
sudden and the rest will be uh, uh, presented by a noted Cuban American writer, Anna Menendez. You know probably about her most important uh, first collection of essays in Cuba was a German Shepherd. And she's going to talk about issues about the Sutton and Dr. Gillespie have negotiated with her about that is uh, dealing with, uh, dealing with American Cuban literature and the inherited sense of exile. Dr. Gillespie. Today. 
uh, his first book, and it's a it, it's a it's a classic, is the decline and fall of liberal liberal Republicans from nine from 1952 to the present. It was published in 1989. He explores how the Republican establishment gradually lost its constituency as a more conservative tide began to run faster and further in this country. Big government with strong social welfare concerns alongside the liberalism of Northeastern and some mid Western patrician Republicans gave way to a sharper and higher edged conservatism that we now know today as neoliberalism, or if you will, the Reagan Revolution, along with a whole spectrum of political values that come along with it. His second book was Southern Democrats, where he looked at the response of conservative, much more conservative Democrats to the onslaught of republicanism, particularly in the South. Uh, it threatened democratic ascendance, and of course, Bill Clinton played an enormous role in this study. Along the way, after that, Nickel published two very important edited collections, one called uh, conservative reformers, which looked at the class of 19, uh, eight, uh, 1994 that entered the House of Representatives led by Newt Gingrich and many others, and that was followed by a pretty insightful view of the U.S. Senate, the contentious Senate partisanship ideology, and the myth of cool judgment. That Senate looks so much better than the one today. <laughs> uh, and his third major book was Impeaching Clinton, again looking at the dynamics of, uh, of strife. The subtitle was Partisan Strife on Capitol Hill. That was, that was co-authored and published in 2003. What do I learn from Nickel? One, he has, a, he has an ability to take an interview and contextualize it and then broaden the analysis. He's so good that every doctoral student I've had, I've urged them, if you're going to do interviews, look at how Nickel does it, because really no one does it as well. So that when I think of the corpus of his work, there's an insight and a wisdom that begins to unfold itself. He's also a conservative, plucky indeed. <laughs> You know, to paraphrase Robert Frost, home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. He doesn't need to come home. He's doing great at MSU, but it's certainly lovely to welcome him back home. Nick O'Reilly.
hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I have some water here in case I, I get a little hoarse from projecting. But I, uh, the nature of this text here and holding a hand mic is just going to make things better. Now, <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Suck, Mildar, Gillespie, and Stack, for your very warm welcome back to FIU. This is the place where well, I will undoubtedly have spent the majority of my professional career, and it has many happy memories. So it's really been a great pleasure to be back here and to have such a, to feel once again among friends and to have such a warm welcome. I'll particularly thank uh, Dr. Stack profusely for his kind remarks. He is an outstanding leader of FIU's School of International and Public Affairs, as he told me, the largest school of international and public affairs on the planet. <laughs> Um, and I think a great deal of what I learned about leadership in academia, and I still have much to learn, I learned from him. So thank you, John, for your counsel and your friendship uh, over the past 26 years. Um, I'm delighted to see that the Exile Studies Program, um, founded by Dr. Omar, is thriving, that the Center for the Humanities and Urban Environment uh, led by Dr. Gillespie, is also moving ahead. Uh, I had some small role to play for both of these programs. The expansion of one, the establishment of the other. And I'm very, very proud to see that they become a major feature on the FIU landscape. And I'm also very flattered to be invited to lecture in the Exile Studies Lecture Series. Um, Alas, and I hate to disappoint you, I can claim neither great experience nor great expertise in Excel studies by comparison with the many distinguished speakers that have come and spoken in this series in the past. What I may know something about is the American political tradition, American political culture, and American political so I ask you to bear with me if the perspective of this lecture is a little political science-y from one of the best, but not overly so. Um, what I'd like to offer this evening is a discussion of the political impact of organized groups of exiles in American politics yesterday and today, and some possible explanations as to the persistent political influence of exile organizations in the U.S. and the institutional constraints on such an I'm going to be a little sloppy with the term exile, and it's a question that I've been wrestling with right up uh, to the start of this lecture. Uh, I'm going to use it in a sense that exile does not, when exiles expire, Exile themes do not die. The emotions of exile, uh, the experiences of exile become transferred to succeeding generations um, connected to the original exile. They recede and advance. As we'll see during my talk at time, one thinks that a certain set of exile issues have lost all residence. And then something happens related to that original exile experience that can dramatically revive it and uh, as, a as a political force. Um, so I will ask you to bear with me in using the word in this less literal sense. Um, I'm going to start, though, before getting into uh, the sort of reflections on exile in American political history with a little bit of my own experience. Um, in my case, I would say that I'm an immigrant, not an exile, but that there are exile themes that will resonate with me personally. 
My decision to leave Scotland the land of my birth was a voluntary one, based on career opportunities. Many of my forebears were not so fortunate. For them, I think they are exiles in the sense that there's an element of compulsion to the decision, and that can be either political or it can be economic. Uh, and the case of the Scottish Highlanders is a little bit of both, particularly that economic factor um, is very important. In the 19th century, the Scottish Highlands, once well populated by Gaelic speaking uh, tenants, tenant farmers, um, were essentially cleared of most of their inhabitants. Now, in Scottish history, this is most commonly blamed on the landowners, many of them former clan chiefs, who found sheep more profitable on the land than their fellow clansmen. This, this portrait, and I think even contemporary Scottish historians and economic historians would say is somewhat overdrawn. Uh, there are a lot of factors that went into the clearances. Um, many landlords were main, conscious, trying to rehouse their tenants, uh, find alternative <coughs> industries and so forth. But there were some egregiously crass examples during the clearance. Probably the worst was the Countess of Sutherland and her husband, the Earl of Stafford, later the first Duke of Sutherland, um, who, though, were, who were utterly ruthless, ruthless in forcefully driving a large number of their tenants out of their homes. And the names of the Countess and the First Duke are still, um, are still, uh, I would say, uh, you have to be careful how you mention them if you go to the County of Sutherland, the far north of North Scotland. Uh, if there's a statue to the First Duke, and I think it's only survived because it's on top of a remote hill. Bother <laughs> <laughs> to go up there and pull it down. But when the Gaelic Festival, uh, the, the festival of Scottish uh, Gaelic music and poetry went to Golsby, which is the main town in Sutherland, uh, and the current uh, Duke and Duchess tried to make some amends. They were very severely rebuffed. Um, it's also true that in addition to forced clearances, the high levels of poverty in the Scottish Highlands in the nineteenth century. Um, and it's a little known fact, I mean, you've heard all of you who great Irish potato fans. The potato became the staple for a lot of Scottish Highlanders, and the same blight affected the potato there, and, you know, had a similar effect in places like Skye and Loch Alch and Mull, um, when the blight basically wiped out the crop and people were literally starving. Anyway, the high levels of poverty in the Scottish Highlands in the late 19th early 20th century left many Highlanders with little choice but to move on. Emigration to Canada, in particular, New Zealand, and the United States was often a matter of sheer physical survival. I have some images here. Don't worry, I'm not going to do a PowerPoint. But um, the, uh, which I find rather interesting. And this is The Last of the Clan by Thomas Five, 1865. And Fyde sort of is depicting here, um, there's even a little text there that goes with uh, the painting. When the steamer had slowly backed out and John McAlpin had thrown off the halter, he began to feel that our once powerful clan was now represented by a feeble old man and his granddaughter, who together with some outlying kith and kin, myself among the number, only on a single blade of grass and land that was once all our own. Of course, it's an extremely romantic piece, but it does capture the very strong emotions uh, invoked by the more or less enforced exile of thousands of Highlanders during this period. Uh, on a somewhat lighter note, shortly after arrival in Montana last January, I was presented with a book entitled Glencoe and the Indian by Dr. James Hunter, whose work I knew because Hunter was perhaps the leading, he's perhaps the leading contemporary historian of all the Scottish diaspora, how that came to be. 
And this book, which I thoroughly recommend to you if you're at all interested, tells an astonishing tale of a member of the MacDonald clan, virtually driven out of the Scottish Highlands by a combination of economic want and sort of uh, a certain degree of perhaps youthful naughtiness, you might say. Um, driven out as a young man, he became a fur trapper, as many Scots did, uh, it, with the Hudson's Bay Company in the Northern Rockies. And he married a Salish Indian woman and engendered a new clan of Salish MacDonalds, who remain a very influential family within the tribe to this day. So here I have, on uh, the clearance village of Strathnaver, this was the most notorious clearance that was carried out by uh, the, the Candace of Sutherland agents. Um, and you can see the ruins of uh, the settlement, the very thriving farming settlement that once was in Strathmaver. And here we have the retirement of President Joe McDonald of Salish Kootenai College in Papua, Montana, in 2010. Uh, and if you go up around Flathead Lake, Glacier National Park, and to the Salish Kootenai Reservation, that name McDonald appears all over the place. And they remain a very influential family within the tribe to this day. So the lesson, ladies and gentlemen, is that we Scots are everywhere. Existence <laughs> is futile. <laughs>
Interestingly, he wrote a will. While in the U.S., bequeathing his American assets to freeing and educating slaves, including his friend Jefferson, it was never executed. There are monuments to Kosciuszko all over the U.S. Statues, parks, streets bearing his name. A county in Indiana, an island in Alaska. Now, this is not accidental. Kosciuszko clearly <coughs> represents the ideal American exile a believer in enlightenment principles of freedom and democracy, as epitomized by the Declaration of Independence, fighting to liberate his people from oppression by autocratic foreign powers, as he helped the Americans shake off the British Empire. <coughs> this has been a recurring theme in American public attitudes towards exile. And here, I follow Louis Hart's view of America, distinctively Lockean liberal political culture based on the political credo set out in the Declaration of Independence. Um, again, just to reiterate that credo, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such a form as to that shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Hence, the American political tradition and culture is likely to be fundamentally ill-disposed toward non-liberal democratic regimes and highly sympathetic to those apparently driven into exile by such regimes. Emma Lazarus's poem, Memorialized on the Statue of Liberty, summarizes this attitude more succinctly, perhaps. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning. Here we have some examples of distinguished American exiles. I could have filled many slides with this, but that would have uh, filled up too much time in the presentation. I tried to find a representative sample. Uh, we have Jose Marti. Uh, next to him, Albert Einstein. Madeleine Albright, whose parents were driven into exile after the communist coup in Czechoslovakia in 1948, went on to a distinguished career in public service in the U.S., culminating as Secretary of State, President Clinton. Um, Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa. Uh, O'Donovan Rossa is a veteran, a Fenian, uh, Irish nationalist who uh, was exiled and died in the United States um, in 1915. Uh, his funeral, in some ways, was kind of a catalyst for the 1960 Easter Rising. I think it was there that Patrick Pierce made a very famous uh, speech. Uh, uh, Anne Rand is next, and then in the bottom row, Hannah Arendt, uh, famous exiles from uh, the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, respectively. Alexander Solzhenitsyn lived for exile in many years in the United States. Harry Wu, Chinese dissident, uh, Igor Stravinsky, Russian composer, and Marlene Dietrich, whose political views did not accord with those of Nazism, and uh, she actually came to the United States and contributed against it to the utmost of her ability. And I could have picked many more names from American culture, academia, intellectuals, um, to put on this list, but I sort of wanted to give a spread as best I could. Uh, and I did sacrifice, apologies to Italian Americans, but I did sacrifice Garibaldi to bring in them over. <laughs> <laughs> but Garibaldi wasn't here very long. Um, America has always liked to think of itself as a safe haven for groups and enforced political or economic exile from their own land. But, there's all this about it. We should not neglect to note two things. 
Uh, however, first, the African slave trade created a special category of Americans who endured enforced exile and servitude in this country, and frequently during U.S. history have felt, as Martin Luther King stated it, like exiles in their own land. Second, there have also been Americans who have gone into voluntary or enforced exile due to fundamental disagreement with the U.S. government of the day, most recently and conspicuously Mr. Edward Snowden. Um, both of these topics are worthy of a lecture in themselves, so please forgive me this evening if I leave them aside as possible future titles uh, for lectures in this excellent series, series and concentrate on my main theme. Uh, the political impact of exiles and organizations representing exiles in the U.S. In addition to the receptivity of American political culture to exiles uh, from oppression beyond these shores, the structure of the American political system has provided a fertile ground for groups of exiles to mobilize politically in order to influence U.S. policy toward their own and exercise influence in U.S. and Mexican politics. Irish, Jews, East Europeans, and Cuban, and many more. In short, the American governmental system has allowed an unusual amount of political influence to groups representing political exiles should they choose to use it. For a start, the U.S. has had a mass electorate by 2030 far earlier than most comparable liberal democracies. This was not a universal franchise. Women and most African Americans were excluded. But it was still large enough to substantiate the claim that the U.S. was the world's first mass democracy. The mass electorate meant that if male political exiles potential votes could be organized, politicians would be compelled to pay attention to their calls. The American separated system government also provides many points of access, the presidency, Congress, the states, and local governments. All of these levels have been used by well-organized exile groups to advance their cause. The relative weakness of the American party system has also helped enhance exiles the lack of centralized party control in the United States has made it easier for exile groups to influence political parties first at the local level and later nationally. The relatively unideological nature of American political parties has meant that exile groups have had the opportunity to enter into party activity at the local or state level and sometimes become the dominant group within the local party. State and national parties problem with this if exile support enabled the party to win elections locally and nationally. Um, particularly so uh, when for a minority party in an area that has largely um, had a dramatic increase in an exile or exile immigrant population. It provides an opportunity for that party to become competitive. Uh, one, one year after I, actually less than a year after I arrived in Miami, I saw an example of this process in action. When Professor Dario Moreno and I studied the special election that occurred after the death of Congressman Claude Pepper. The Cuban exile population and from the late 1950s and 60s and their subsequent additions right up to Marielle and their children who had become an increasingly large portion of the Miami-Dade County electorate found other groups of interest locally largely control the dominant Democratic Party. So as they organized politically, the human exile population found it easier to enter and control the weaker minority Republican Party and make it more receptive to their political issues. In the special election to replace Pepper, two prominent local Cuban exile female politicians ran. One Democrat, Miami City Commissioner Rosario Kennedy, and 
one Republican, State Senator Ileana Ross Lee. Kennedy lost her primary runoff to a non Cuban Democrat who secured over 60% of the vote against her. While Ross Lakeman, with 83% of the vote in the Republican primary, was more or less unopposed and went on to win the general election. She still sits in Congress today, almost 25 years ago. An example of political mobilization of an exile population. Demographic realities and the American federal system of elections have also tended to work to the advantage of well-organized political exile groups. Exiles, like most other American immigrants, have tended to congregate in major urban areas where economic and political opportunities for advancement tend to be greater. Exile political influence therefore tends to be heavier in more populous states with larger numbers of electoral votes. Electoral votes that candidates need to carry to secure the president. Thus, the American system of electing presidents via the Electoral College or state-by-state -state plurality elections for slates of electors committed to presidential candidates, so that's what we really do, has tended to enhance the influence of well-organized exile. So, despite these potential advantages, however, that the U.S. political culture and political system provide exiles, the key to exile influence in American politics is, and always has been, effective political mobilization. And this requires, first, that a significant immigrant population is still concerned with events in the homeland and seeks to influence American policy in a direction hostile to the homeland's rulers or the homeland's foreign enemies or occupiers. Second, this population needs to be naturalized and therefore enfranchised so they can exert electoral Third, sufficient resources, money and manpower, have to be available to mobilize and organize these voters. Now, traditionally, American state and local political parties facilitated this process as they provided the initial resources to mobilize exile voters in order to gain an electoral advantage for the party. Classic examples of this were the political machines of the 19th century. And as mentioned above, we still see the process in operation today with the Republican Party and the Cuban population of South Florida over the period from about the late 1970s to the present. Once established, uh, however, successful, successful exile organizations are eventually able to generate a reliable financial and resource financial and activist base by themselves, in part due to the economic advancement of the exile population. An exile population, an ex well, an immigrant population influenced by exile themes, still seeking to influence events in the homeland, politically mobilized with the necessary financial and manpower resources at their disposal and concentrated in electorally critical cities and states can thereby play a significant role in American politics. Parties and candidates for elections, once convinced that there's a potential block of responsive voters whose vote will be determined solely or largely on the basis of exile issues, will perforce pay close attention to the political agenda of organized exile uh, organizations. At the same time, exile leaders and organizations must work to maintain a high level of awareness regarding homeland issues among exiles and succeeding generations, the children and grandchildren of exile, 
also continue to raise the funds to maintain their organizations and get their message out. For these efforts to succeed uh, over time, there must be continuing oppression or conflict in the homeland that the American exile organizations hope the United States can somehow effectively address. Thus, a century and a half of sectarian and political conflict in Ireland after the potato famine of the 1840s kept Irish issues at the forefront of the political consciousness of succeeding generations of the immigrant community of Irish America. Ongoing Arab-Israeli conflict in the Middle East has had a similar impact among Jewish Americans. And of course, the persistence of the Castro regime has done the same. Thus, these groups remain mobilizable politically on issues related to their homeland. And exile lobbies work hard to make sure that their constituencies are informed and kept apprised of events there, and that American political parties and politicians are aware that an electorally significant segment of voters are still likely to make their voting choices based on exile issues. If members of the exile group begin to rise socially and economically, they provide an enhanced fundraising base for exile organizations and a leadership cadre whose members get elected to office and can directly represent the group positions in state legislatures and the U.S. Congress. So those are the success stories. But why do some exile lobbies never mobilize effectively? Or are they mobilized but then decline in influence? Well, certainly to mobilize effectively, there needs to be a strong exile identity of the homeland and awareness of political events there. If this is absent, groups claiming to represent the interests of exiles are likely to have little influence. While American society provides ample opportunity for organized exile groups. Powerful assimilationist pressures are also a factor that can have an increasing effect, particularly on succeeding generations of immigrants. Exile populations may also be scattered rather than concentrated geographically, have low rates of voter participation, or remain in relatively low socioeconomic status. And the last two are generally related. Socially mobile and ambitious members of the exile population may also be reluctant to be perceived as mere advocates for their exiles. The case of Jewish Americans before and after World War II is an interesting one. Prior to the war, powerful assimilationist pressures in the Jewish community attenuated Jewish identity, so many prominent Jewish reluctant to assume it. And Jewish organizations in the 1930s were generally unsuccessful in mobilizing the community effectively on issues affecting Jews in Europe despite increasingly evident mass prosecution. The impact of the Holocaust transformed this situation. American Jews determined to stop such horrors occurring, occurring to their people again and were much more easily mobilized by Jewish organizations on issues pertaining to Jewish persecution abroad and fighting in defense of the fledgling state of Israel. And in a sense, this is what I mean when I talk about sort of exile advancing and receding uh, at different points in American history. Another example. <laughs> by the early 1960s, the election of President Kennedy, it really seemed that the distinct that the impact of issues in Ireland on Irish Americans had receded, uh, had become sort of a, an aspect of another era that had somehow been surpassed. Um, but the out, 
the, the eruption of sectarian conflict in Northern Ireland in the late 1960s served to refocus Irish-American social and political organizations and political leaders such as Sanders Edward Kennedy, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and House Speaker Tim O'Neill on efforts to redress the grievances of Northern Irish Catholics and press for political solution to their troubles. Another example, uh, I don't think in the early 1970s Greek Americans were regarded as a particularly powerful lobby in U.S. foreign policy. And yet, in 1974, when Turkey invaded the island of Cyprus and effectively annexed that the fifth of it, this aroused the politically dormant Greek American lobby to such a degree that the U.S. Congress passed an embargo on Turkey against the wishes of President Joe Ford. Now these are interesting cases where an exile lobby that apparently become politically dormant due to assimilationist pressures and diminishing exile identities was suddenly revived by traumatic events in the original homeland or that affected members of the group overseas. And here's another related example from personal I'll have a swig of water. In the spring of 2012, I taught, I taught a class in San Marco Rubio, and he got into a little trouble for drinking water too much. <laughs> so I hope uh, uh, I won't meet the same fate. Uh, at any rate, uh, as Dr. Stack mentioned, I was an ATSA congressional fellow, and uh, in the spring of 1996, I worked for several months for Congressman George Radonovich, a banker and winemaker from Mariposa, California, of Croatian descent, and uh, he was elected in the 1994 Republican Circuit. George Radonovich claimed he came to D.C. primarily to cut government and carry out a Republican revolution. His arrival in Congress, however, coincided with the height of the Balkan Wars following the breakup of Yugoslavia. And George found himself to be one of only two members of Croatian descent on Capitol Hill at a time when Croatia was very much in the international spotlight. The new congressman now found himself expected to be a spokesman for Croatia in Congress Although I don't think his Croatian identity had been particularly strong in the two. So instead of concentrating exclusively on cutting budgets, he was pressured to make trips to war-torn Bosnia, sometimes under gunfire while he was there. He also hired a full-time staffer to work on issues related to the strife um, in the Balkans and founded a Croatian-American Congressional Caucus. Now, I really don't think that he anticipated this when he ran for the House in 1994. Uh, it really wasn't on his radar, but suddenly he got there and Croatian-American organizations said, you're our guy. <laughs> um, now, while working for him, uh, see, I and his Balkan staff were Mark Redielovic, had to substitute for him at a Croatian embassy reception. And after I had been chatting to a very distinguished looking uniform gentleman, Marco asked me, is that the first time you've met an alleged war criminal? <laughs> uh, so that, this wasn't quite what I expected when I went to work on the Hill either. Um, so I think it's a, a demonstration of how suddenly uh, these issues can become very important on the political radar screen for individual politicians. Beyond social change and the lack of organizational capacity, there are other factors that can operate against the influence of even a potent exile law in American politics. One obvious factor that counteracts exile influence is if the agenda of exile groups is held by the federal government to be contrary to the foreign policy interests of the U.S. 
what if the homeland regime or other occupying power that's seen as oppressive by exiles is a close foreign policy ally in the United States? In these situations, exile demands are unlikely to prevail, and in a time of warfare or international crisis, even less so. Irish American outrage at the execution by the British government of the leaders of the 1916 Easter Rising did not deter President Woodrow Wilson's increasing alignment of the neutral US with Great Britain, nor precluded America's eventual entry into World War I on Britain's side a year later. It did, however, probably affect the debate on the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, because I think if, uh, <clears throat> to the extent that Congress is the key decision maker, the exile of office can be much greater than, it, than with the executive branch. And I'll elaborate a little bit on that. Irish, German, and Italian American mobilization by isolationist politicians in the 1930s and later by the American First Movement was rendered irrelevant by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and subsequent declarations of war in the U.S. by Japan's allies hit The enhanced power that falls upon the federal executive branch in foreign policy and during periods of international crisis tends to operate against exile influence. Congress, as a legislature elected from states and districts, tends to lend itself far more easily to pressure from exile influence than the executive branch, which is expected to take decisive action in the national interest in times of emergency and according to the interpretation of the Constitution, has those powers uh, in that area. Great powers of discretion in responding to international crisis and emergency. In fact, though, when the final decision lies with Congress, we have examples of exile lobbies prevailing. Versailles to some extent in 1919, which required the ratification of the treaty, and two-thirds of the Senate, which is a pretty high barrier. It's a pretty high barrier. Um, and again, the example I gave of the Turkey embargo after the invasion of Cyprus, which was congressionally driven.
But while these exile groups have exerted and almost certainly will continue to exert influence over American politics and foreign policy, they and can occasionally achieve success where Congress is invoked or have to be involved in the decision. I think whether the demands prevail or not over the long term will continue to depend on the cold hard claims of American national interest as determined by the executive branch and foreign policy elites at a particular time. So, that's all I have to say. <laughs> The bumper sticker was, well, the last American 
believe they can please take the flag. <laughs> <laughs> and that's at everything. The total mobilization of, the, of Cubans who had expected to go back to uh, and Cuban exiles who expected to go back to the homeland. And they became they became uh, voting Republicans. Carmel. Hi. Um, nice to um, I'm going away. I don't know if it's because it's very far from my expertise, but for, for several years I've taught a class in the Great Depression, and it seemed to me that one phenomenon that we can observe in the Great Depression is internal exile of the religious population. As people move for economic reasons, they can't go back. Um, <coughs> migration is <coughs> But the other big migration in the 30s and the 40s was, was African Americans who right. came from South. Mm -hmm. So, if you're describing what happened to those communities, I mean, would you consider them an example of an exile community in the United States? I think it's an interesting question. Uh, it's uh, it's an interesting question because clearly it, the, that migration has a transformational impact uh, in in the urban North. Which it has a, it has a transformational impact long term on the party system because it's that migration, the enfranchisement of the African Americans in the North that makes politicians begin to pay attention. Uh, I mean, by the time we get to Harry Truman in 1948, um, and uh, it also I mean, and then I'm, I'm going way out of my league, but I mean, there are also aspects of the Southern African American culture that get taken to the North and survive or even enhance in, in terms of, of music and so forth, dialect, it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, I mean, we have smaller examples, of course, are the Hokies and Arkans going, going to California, where there was a, and they also met with pretty severe discrimination. Uh, but I don't know how much of an impact they have that's where my history kind of trails off. But I was thinking of, of because the African American um, migration tended to cluster not, not just in big cities, but I know they clustered by community once they got there. So they brought their oh. ties with them. I mean, it, I think any accounts of the 1948 presidential election was, was the one where the Democratic Party started picking up the civil rights issue was emphasize the fact that Truman's campaign was, Truman and his campaign were increasingly aware that the, the migrant African American population from the south in the northern cities, in the big electoral vote states, uh, was going to demand more political attention. And more no question about it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go um, you may have a very interesting point. You said that uh, after the exiles, the next generation, you tend to lose interest on what's going on in the Oklahoma. And, um, and then, therefore, they lose interest on, on foreign policy. So, but it can uh, come back. Yeah, so my question the right, sir, I mean, it, the, the, uh, it, in a sense, exile experience, in a way, rather like politicians to talk about party identity or religious identities, can, can almost lie later and then uh, some event or you know can can bring it back even for the succeeding generations so, who didn't have direct experience. So my question is how can the next generation keep going, you know, like not lose sight of what happened in the previous generation? Like is there a way that it happened or is it just by external circumstances that it takes a Holocaust to um, not entirely. I think if the political organizations are very effective uh, in, uh, in mobilization, they can reach out to the succeeding generations and emphasize the importance of these issues, even, even if it's during a relatively quiet or late period. Uh, I mean, they're, in a sense, part of their mission is to maintain the history of the identity Experience in the minds of succeeding generations. And I think the more effective ones 
uh, and the ones that have the greater purchase or influence will succeed in doing that. I know it's been a you know, very long day for the American Captain Walk, but busy. And so um, I'd like to uh, close the, uh, the questions now and just remind you three weeks from tonight, Anna Menendez will be uh, coming to a uh, talk and a uh, short reading. If you'd like any more information uh, on that, it will be coming out of the center and you can see me at the, uh, at the, end, of the uh, end of the presentation. But now, will you join me in?